station working for you. This is WRTV News at 6, streaming now. Happy Halloween and thank you so much for joining us at 6. I'm Amber Grigley. We're starting off tonight with a look at what you can expect if you're heading out for some trick-or-treating. Well, this is a live look right now at a haunted house set up on the northeast northwest side, excuse me, of Indianapolis. We've already seen some families drop by. You can see, oh my goodness, check out the decoration there. They went all the way out this year for their haunted house. Nice weather for your Sunday forecast, making way for a dry evening for all the trick-or-treaters out there. Let's go ahead and check in with Storm Team Meteorologist Kyle Mounts. And Kyle, Halloween is back this year. A lot of people are super excited. I've been seeing it all on my timeline today. And guess what? They want you to tell them something good. Don't go breaking their hearts now. You know, they're going to be able to put those hardworking costumes <laughs> into some good use this evening because we've got really some pretty nice weather when you consider the weather that is coming our way here. Couldn't have really lined up too much of a better forecast for trick-or-treaters this evening. It is 55 right now in downtown, 56 for you in the Martinsville area. Now the one issue we've got, yeah, it's a little breezy out there. Now we've got that wind out of the northwest around 15 to even 20 miles per hour. But hey, the most important thing here as we look at the satellite and radar, we are dry out there tonight. So as kids are heading out, it is all treats, no tricks in the candy bowl tonight. We've got temperatures that'll be in the middle 50s now, lower 50s and partly to mostly cloudy skies here by 8 o'clock this evening. Coming up, we're going to be talking about temperatures really taking a tumble here and it will happen pretty fast, including the chance for some frost and freeze conditions. The silver lining, though, finally a chance to dry out. All right, thank you so much, Kyle, for that weather update. Well, community groups and city leaders called for a ceasefire this weekend. It was supposed to last 72 hours, but early this morning, Indianapolis surpassed last year's record setting number of homicides after another shooting. Investigators say just before 2 a.m., officers responded to reports of a person shot on Hovey Street. Now that's on the north side near the intersection of Ralston and East 30th Street. IMPD says a man with a gunshot wound was taken to the hospital hospital in critical condition where he later died. According to IMPD, this is the city's 232nd homicide of the year. That matches the total record setting number of homicides in 2020. This afternoon, ceasefire events and peace rallies continued across the city at Gustafson Park on the west side. The rally included activities for kids and a free cookout you see happening right there on your screen. Organizers and promoters of the event say despite the shootings over the last 24 hours, their mission will continue to find an end to the systemic reasons for violence. It's a lot of things going on in the city too for us like poverty, and, and a lot of things, like people are frustrated, you know what I mean? Like, wrong wasn't built in a day. I'm not saying we're going to save the world with this right here, but if we just do our part, you know what I mean? I think that's really how it matters, though, and that's really how we can do. Organizers stress the importance of reaching out to kids to make an impact with anti-violence initiatives. COVID-19 vaccines for younger kids could be approved for emergency use this week. Pfizer has already shipped millions of doses to its pediatric vaccine to many places across the country. ABC's Phil Lipoff has the latest on the upcoming decision from health officials. A CDC advisory panel meets Tuesday for a vote on whether to recommend Pfizer's vaccine for children between the ages of 5 and 11. The green light to administer those shots could come from Director Dr. Rochelle Walensky soon after. Preparations already underway across the country to administer the pediatric doses to the 28 million children who would then be eligible. We have ordered the maximum number of doses allowable um, and we'll be opening up uh, scheduling for our vaccine clinic um, very soon. Pediatrician Dr. Eliza Bakken plans to have have her kids vaccinated. I just can't wait to both um, line my kids up to be vaccinated and also to talk about it with the families of my patients and, and get kids vaccinated. A Kaiser Family Foundation poll finds only 27% of parents say they want to get their children vaccinated right away. Another 33% want to wait and see. I'm not sure. I don't think I know enough about it. Meantime, the push is on to get the largest city in the country vaccinated. New York City workers had until this past Friday at 5 p.m. to get at least one dose of the vaccine or be placed on unpaid leave as of Monday. More than 90 percent of those employees have complied with about 2,300 getting their first dose on Saturday, according to New York City Mayor Bill de Blasio. Though several fire companies had to close over the weekend due to lack of staffing and multiple sick calls, officials saying this has not affected fire response. 
I have had members that have received the vaccination saying they're having flu-like symptoms and they have to go sick. The department is allowing people to have a couple of days off after they get the vaccination. The commissioner calling the excessive sick leave unacceptable, saying it is contrary to their oaths to serve and may endanger the lives of New Yorkers. Phil Lipoff, ABC News, New York. Developing tonight in Fayette County, a fire that has left a family temporarily homeless is under investigation as, quote, suspicious in nature. The Cornersville Fire Department posted on social media a call about the fire came in around 3.30 Friday morning to this home on North Grand Avenue. Fire officials say it was contained to one room. Along with the fire damage, the family that lives in the home showed us where a racial slur was spray painted on their back porch. Emma Williams owns the home with her husband, Cornersville Council member Tommy Williams. She says the family was out of town and neighbors told her about the fire. Williams says rather than hold on to anger about all of this, she forgives whoever did this. Neighbors we spoke with feel the same. It just breaks my heart. I just, I'm heartbroken. I'm heartbroken that somebody would think that they needed to do something like that to them. Nobody. I mean, nobody. Not Tommy, not me, not Angie, not Gary, not Paul. Nobody in this world deserves what happened. Williams says the FBI is leading the investigation to the fire at their home. The Department of Homeland Security confirms the Indiana State Fire Marshal is investigating and also referred us to the FBI as well. A cause of the fire has not been determined at this time. We did reach out to the FBI along with Cornersville Police Department to learn more about the investigation. Of course, we will continue to update you on air and online as we learn more. Well, President Biden and other world leaders are wrapping up the G20 summit in Rome. Climate change, humanitarian issues, and global supply chain problems have dominated the conversation. ABC's Mary Alice Park shows us how the president says the U.S. will address bottlenecks that are slowing down the global economy. Day two of the G20 summit here in Rome. President Biden is holding an event specifically focused on those global supply chain issues. He says he's trying to address the massive shipping product delays and price increases that have really hit American consumers. His team says it's about identifying bottlenecks and working with other countries to help make sure when COVID flares up, it does not stop critical manufacturing. Now that we have seen how vulnerable these lines of global commerce can be, we cannot go back to business as usual. The president here also announced a deal with the EU to suspend steel and aluminum tariffs put in place under President Trump. The U.S. will allow some of those materials to come into the U.S. duty free. And in exchange, the EU will scrap tariffs put in place on things like American whiskey and motorcycles. And the White House says the agreement should help bring down costs for U.S. manufacturers and in theory for consumers, too. Now, President Biden and the president of the European Commission spoke in front of the cameras on this. They said the arrangement will also help with fighting climate change. Basically, China has often flooded the market with Chinese steel, and experts say that has contributed a lot to that country's greenhouse gas emissions. Together, China and the United States represent 40% of global greenhouse gas emissions, so what happens there impacts the rest of the world. Mary Alice Parks, ABC News, Rome. And WRTV has been keeping track of how global supply chain issues are impacting central Indiana. Many stores are loading up on holiday inventory earlier than usual. And experts say you shouldn't wait for deals or discounts to get what you want. And a national bottle shortage is putting pressure on local wineries and distilleries. The general manager of Cons Fine Winers and Spirits told us the store has only been getting what their suppliers have in stock. He says demand is through the roof and glass bottles are in short supply. As you plan your holiday celebrations, remember to shop early and understand your drink of choice might be out of stock. And for me, what it does is helps us to be able to celebrate our service as women veterans. Honoring hometown heroes. Still ahead, the effort underway to never forget the sacrifice of Hoosier women who served in the military.
something you might have noticed on your last trip to the BMV. Hoosiers have a lot of options when it comes to specialty license plates. Everything from military related causes to wild turkeys to the Lewis and Clark expedition. And there's a campaign underway right now to add another license plate option to honor women veterans. WRTV's Alyssa Donovan explains. More than 30,000 women have served in the military here in Indiana. But aside from exhibits like this here at the War Memorial, a lot of that service goes unnoticed. Unfortunately, all too often when you see a woman at the grocery store with her Army or Air Force sweatshirt on, the general public assumes that they're wearing their spouse's shirt. But for decades, women have been breaking barriers as U.S. service members. Throughout history, women have been on the front lines of wars, playing critical roles, just like Dr. Dottie Simpson-Taylor. So I went into the Air Force in 1963 during Vietnam. Dr. Dottie was aligned with the service for more than 20 years, and now she and other women are advocating for a way to better show a female Hoosier has served in the military. And the reason for that is because sometimes our service is invisible. We're mistaken as the child of the veteran or the spouse of the veteran. I want them to have something that says, like my cap says, I'm a proud woman veteran. So I want to see that on the license plate. We shouldn't be afterthoughts. We should be front and center also. So I just think that a, that a, a women's veteran license plate would bring that forward. Right now, Indiana does offer veteran plates, but Air Force veteran Lisa Wilkin says showing the distinction of women veterans would make a huge difference. You know, I have an Air Force plate on my vehicle, and when I park at Lowe's in that specialty spot, a lot of times when I get out, I'll get a comment made to me about that's for when your husband's driving the truck. And then I have to explain that's my truck. I served. My husband never served. Which is why she is helping draft a bill for a women veterans license plate in Indiana. 18 other states have plates specifically for women who have served. I think that much of the time um, people conceive, con conceptualize veterans as men. And women veterans feel that profoundly in many of the conversations that are had and many of the kinds of activities that are, um, that, that are prepared. The hope is that passing this legislation and highlighting that women are serving in the military will help bring more visibility to a group that is often overlooked. And what this plate does is it gives women veterans the opportunity to celebrate our service and designate ourselves as a veteran. It also gives us the opportunity to educate the public. When people sit at the stoplights and they travel, they pay attention to those license plates. And when they see woman veteran, it just reinforces to them the idea that women proudly serve. I'm Alyssa Donovan, WRTV. Revenue from the plate would go toward the Indiana Department of Veterans Affairs, specifically for its Women Veteran Program. The program helps educate people about female service and provides resources to women veterans in the state. All right, let's check in now with Kyle Mounts with a look at your Halloween forecast. And you know, Amber, this afternoon it was nice outside, had a lot of sunshine, didn't have to wear the jacket. I don't think that's going to be the case, though, for the week ahead. High temperatures today, though, we made it in the 60s in many spots 62 in Indianapolis just missed out there in Lafayette and check out Shelbyville this afternoon at 65 degrees temperatures they're still pretty nice out there and on the mild side although we've got that north and northwest wind going along with it our temperature 55 downtown now still in the upper 50s around Bedford and Seymour but already the lower 50s in Frankfurt and Monticello and by tomorrow morning it is going to be a frosty start to the day here Jacket certainly required 31 degrees in Crawfordsville, 36 in Bloomington, as well as Indianapolis and the Columbus area and about 34 in Muncie. So you might want to turn on the heat here for the overnight hours. Otherwise, it's probably going to be quite chilly as you wake up tomorrow morning inside the house. We've got temperatures 
This isn't just a one and done kind of thing here. These morning lows are going to be in the 30s and possibly by the time we get into Wednesday and Thursday morning, we're going to see some areas that are in the upper 20s to start off the day. On Monday, temperatures really aren't going to recover a whole lot either. The clouds are rolling back in here for us and temperatures only about 47 degrees at noon. It will not be as breezy tomorrow, so that will help us a little bit, but temperatures about 50 for that afternoon high. That is certainly below average for this time of year at 52 for you in Bloomington and Muncie and 49 the afternoon high in Crawfordsville. It's going to be dry though. We certainly need that dry time here after the top four wettest October on record. So if you do need to get that car washed, you get the green light for that here Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, right on through Friday. Actually, as we look at Truecast here, as far as the cloud cover, we mentioned those tomorrow on Truecast. We're going to have quite a bit of cloud cover, but then as we get into Tuesday, I think the sunshine will return, brighten things up, even though it stays rather chilly. Here's a look at the extended forecast highs in the upper 40s for you there Tuesday, Wednesday, and actually Thursday, Friday as well. As we look ahead to next weekend, temperatures moderate a little bit, maybe an isolated shower going into our Sunday. And of course, we fall back with the time change. It starts with the Colts way on top and ends unlike any game we've seen in a very long time. I'm Brad Brown at Lucas Oil Stadium, a week eight recap coming up on WRTV News. The only thing more shocking than the beginning of Sunday's game was the ending. The Colts scored 14 points in the first half of the opening quarter. Jonathan Taylor starting things off with a big run to move it down the field. Carson Wentz found Michael Pittman Jr. for the game's first score, capping a 14-play drive. A Kenny Moore interception with a good return right after that took the ball inside the 10-yard line, and that was followed by Wentz to Pittman again. A couple of quick jabs had the Colts rolling 14 to nothing. Things turned firmly toward the Titans for the middle quarters. Tennessee took their first lead in the third with a 14-play drive that ended with Ryan Tannehill finding IU product Nick Westbrook Aquina in the end zone. But the Colts countered with a Wentz to Jack Doyle touchdown. That one set up by a long pass interference penalty, and Indy would hang on to a three-point edge heading to the fourth quarter. I mean, that's a good defense. It's a, it's a good defense, and, you know, every time you line up against them, you got your work cut out. You know, I thought Coach did a great job calling the game and early, you know, obviously scoring the way we did. Um, but, but it's a good defense. You know, we had, we had some shots, didn't make them. I got to make some better throws. We had a couple, you know, pass interferences that were big for us. Um, but it's a good defense, and we got to just make more plays. A tie game in the final 90 seconds would see twists and turns unlike any that we've seen in a long time. Wentz under pressure in the end zone tries to get rid of it, but is intercepted at the goal line. Line, and that's a touchdown for Tennessee. And suddenly the Colts found themselves down by seven. Yeah, that was 100% my fault. It was a bad call. Um, yeah, it was a screen to mow, and they were sitting right on it. Uh, you know, we hadn't thrown that. Didn't think they would ever be thinking that at that point in the game. And uh, I've been around too long to know that you don't call a screen backed up in that situation. And I told Carson right after that play, he came over the sideline and said, that's 100% my fault. That's a terrible play call. Yeah, I mean, they had it covered up pretty good, obviously. Terrible play. Terrible play, one-on-one -on -one back, trying to find a way to just get rid of the ball. And next thing you know, I'm about to go down. Uh, so, yeah, one I definitely want back. Uh, that, one, that one hurts a little bit. But enough time left for another long pass interference penalty that helped move the ball down the field. Jonathan Taylor took it in for what would be the tying score. After the kick, the game was 31 all and going to overtime. The final twist came after another turnover. Wentz throwing his second interception of the day. The Titans with solid field position after the return. And a minute later, the game winning 45 yard field goal finishes it off. A strange and wacky way for it all to end as the Colts go down 34-31. Thankful we got a quick one here. Quick one, turn around. It's, it's at home too, which is nice. Um, just no time, really. Go watch. I'll watch the tape tonight. I'll move on. I'll wake up in the morning and it's on to the next. So uh, that's the same mindset I have even in a game. Make a bad play, got to go, go back and score like we did tonight. And, you know, you got to just move on and, and move past it and um, keep that kind of gunslinging mentality and then try and, you know, limit those mistakes. I'm probably not thinking anything slipped through our fingers. Um, I understand. It's a really big hole to come back and win the division. The odds are really stacked against us. But, um, yeah, I'm just not wired to think like that. So um, what the way that I am wired and the way that our team is wired is we got a game on Thursday night. we got to come back and i gotta, I got to get better 
as a coach. We have to get better playing. The loss puts Indy three losses behind Tennessee, who is now firmly in control of the AFC South Division race. More importantly, the Titans hold the 2-0 edge over the Colts, which will give them tiebreakers toward the end of the season, which could make the things all the more crazier come playoff potential time. A short turnaround for the Colts to think about all of it, though. They'll be right back here on Thursday night to take on the New York Jets. At Lucas Oil Stadium, Brad Brown, WRTV Sports. Finally tonight, a look at how little ones also cute spending Halloween at Community Hospital North are getting into the spooky spirit. Caregivers help families dress up their babies, some clever costumes there, including a Subway sandwich, a taco, and baby Harry Potter. How cute. Oh, yeah, <laughs> those are some sweet treats right there. That's all the parents want, right? I know. Yeah, oh so adorable. I love that spider. <laughs> All right, as we check out our forecast, if you're still going to be heading out and doing some trick or treating here the next couple of hours, a little bit of that northwest breeze. Otherwise, not bad. We've got temperatures that'll be falling through the 50s and then highs in the 40s this week. All right, that's all the time we have for you. Thank you so much for joining us at six. We'll see you back here at 11.